Phyllis's next guest has some powerful and timely observations about society and the ending of this pandemic. Jim Selman is an internationally recognized leader and respected authority on organizational transformation and culture change. He is the author of Living in a Real-Time World, Six Capabilities to Prepare Us for an Unimaginable Future. Jim will also share some thoughts from his latest work, Serene Ambition. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time, I guess, inside the question of what's going on in the larger world and what is its impact on our practical daily lives. And it's been my observation that a great many people are uh, in various states of anxiety, fear, confusion, uh, upset, uh, disappointment, uh, disillusionment, uh, all kinds of different emotions and moods seem to be getting stirred up. And I don't think it's all related to the pandemic. You know, I think if we look at what's happening socially and politically, uh, and certainly what's going on environmentally, uh, we are at a pretty unique time in human history. Uh, I can't remember ever, obviously in my lifetime, but never in terms of all the things I've ever read, a time when there was so much happening, where the stakes were so high, where the consequences, if, particularly if you think about climate change, are irreversible, uh, and in which uh, essentially our future is at stake. Uh, you've written two books, you've written several books, but these last two have had a tremendous impact, Living in a Real-Time World and Serene Ambition. So what were you looking at in Serene Ambition? Well, Serene Ambition is actually a collection of blogs. It's, it's not a cover to cover book. It's more of a thing you can uh, read when you're uh, resting or reflecting. Uh, and it's, uh, it was just an, ex it was a story of my experience over about a three year period, mostly when I was living in South America on the subject of aging, in particular, my own aging. And I was uh, coming to grips with the fact that aging is also, like most things, an interpretation. So on one level, I was trying to sort of document my own experience as I was getting older, uh, but also beginning to record my reflections in trying to see that I have a choice in how I experience aging. So for example, I actually am looking forward to aging, and I don't know very many people that are. Uh, except the teenagers and the younger people in our lives. Uh, but but the, the, uh, the notion that, that age is an interpretation is just simply another variation of the notion that our whole world is an interpretation. And it's an interpretation that lives in our culture, it lives in our history, it lives in our daily practices over, over long, long periods of time. Uh, and, what, and we loosely refer to that as reality. And we don't appreciate that our reality is not uh, an objective fact, but it's a, it's a whole interpretation of the world. But it's an important interpretation because it organizes how we see things, how things occur for us, and whether something shows up as a threat or whether something shows up as an opportunity or a possibility is the kind of uh, choice that I'm trying to show people in terms of being able to connect people's experience of living with their observation of the world that they inhabit. Uh, our world today right now is under serious stress as everybody knows. Uh, you know, we have uh, some considerable uh, soul searching to do, I suppose, in terms of what are we really committed to as human beings. Uh, it's one thing to uh, be on a soapbox and talk about climate change and debate who did it or why it's happened or point fingers at each other. But it's a quite another thing to think about. It doesn't really make a lot of difference who's right in this argument if you accept the fact that it's changing and that it's changing in a way that could very well uh, prove a threat to the species. Uh, I've just finished uh, reading a book called Radical Hope. Uh, and Radical Hope is about the loss of a world, the collapse of a world, the disappearance of a world, of the Crow Indians, 
uh, and the Crow Indians for their whole tenure had lived in the context of, a, of the buffalo. The buffalo is uh, their, their connection with their spiritual world, their practical world, uh, their survival. Uh, but they, they, they lost that when the buffalo were slaughtered and when the buffalo disappeared from the plains. And when the world, when their buffalo disappeared, the chief at the time uh, of the Crow Indians was quoted as saying, when the buffalo disappeared or after the buffalo disappeared, after the buffalo disappeared, nothing happened. Now, what he was, what he was saying, not that there weren't bodies living, not that there wasn't physical uh, existence, but that the meaning in their world disappeared. And when that meaning left, nothing happened or whatever was happening had no meaning. The, the, the idea is that the, the author's name is Jonathan Lear, is, is proposing and trying to show us that worlds have always come and gone. You know, the, the, the world of the Mayans, you know, disappeared, you know, and, and the world of many, many cultures have disappeared. And in the disappearance of those worlds, new worlds have emerged. And I propose that we're in that kind of a state currently. We're in a state where our world might very well be disappearing. I happen to think that it is, and that we don't know yet what the new world is that is emerging. And so this poses a very central question, which is how do we function and live together and individually in that state, that state sort of between trapezes where the new world hasn't occurred, but we're all pretty clear that the old world is breaking down at ever increasing speed. So as that older world, more familiar world, the world that we're comfortable with, the world of our comfort zones, the world of our common sense, as that world is beginning to break down and make less and less sense, and we see more and more anomalies and have our points of view about it, uh, we need to consider how do you navigate in that reality? How do you make choices? How do you uh, make investments? How do you organize your lives? How do you organize your relationships? What conversations do you have? And so that's really where I've been going a lot during this pandemic and uh, the reading and study that I've been doing on that subject uh, leave me with a kind of calm, a kind of serenity, a kind of uh, openness uh, that I perhaps have not experienced so many times in my life where I can really begin to see, I really don't know like anyone else what's going to happen, but I do know that we are here. And if we can know that we don't know and not be concerned about it, then we can all participate in whatever ways we do in engaging this new world that is emerging. I'm often using the, uh, in the book, in fact, I use the um, metaphor of the Star Trek Enterprise uh, for where the world is, I think. You know, we are literally going where we've never gone before and we don't have any maps. So we're, make, we're map making as we go, just like those early explorers when they, uh, looked at their existing maps and saw that there were dragons on the edge where the end of the world was. And yet those courageous, adventuresome explorers were committed to the possibility that there was something beyond that. And they were willing to engage and face that. Now we're dealing with a much more complex reality than, than they were in the 1500s. But at the same time, I think it's a pretty good metaphor because we don't have clarity around what we should do. And more importantly, we don't have a lot of experience in examining carefully who are we in the face of that kind of uncertainty. Everything you say has moved me to this question. There have always been extraordinary individuals who have been the pillars of societies even when those societies have broken down. I think of Aristotle, I think of Plato. Uh, it, it seems to me that we need to identify those pillars in our current environment 
because that may be what we hold on to as we move to whatever is next. I mean, by letting go of certain key people or key ideas, we leave ourselves open to anarchy or chaos. Um, I mean, there are people who think we have to have those things like chaos. But, but Phyllis, that, that statement you made is grounded in this notion of, of your history and my history. And, look, and relative to everything we know, we can be afraid or concerned that if we don't do X, Y, and Z, then we will have anarchy or whatever. But the, even we don't even know that. You know, we we you know we don't have any idea what would happen or what's going to happen or what's going to emerge. It really this really is uncharted uh, territory. So you're saying what I'm saying is grounded in what I know as opposed to what I don't know. Yes, what you know, what you believe, what options we typically can consider when you're looking at uncharted territory. Like if we don't uh, have strong leaders, then bad things will happen. With respect to that uh, idea about the importance of identifying and holding on to strong leaders, uh, Another thing that's going on with me is I'm rethinking the whole area of leadership. I'm, I'm for example, thinking of leaders now as navigators. You know, and again, in the early days, uh, the navigators did not know where they were going either. You know, they might have had some ideas on a, they, what, whatever they could imagine might exist, but they did not know what was going to be on the other side if there was another side. And, and yet those navigators uh, were able to know where they were, they were able to know where they came from, and they were able to hold the commitment that people had to the adventure. They were able to hold the commitment they had to the idea or hold the commitment they had to the possibility of a short route to India or whatever particular raison d'etre they, they, were, they were following. Uh, I, I think, it's important that we listen deeply and listen broadly, that we need to listen to people we maybe don't listen to normally. I think we need to listen, not just for the stereotypical strong leaders who profess to know and then gather a following to follow them, but really begin to open up the fact that we don't know, we don't, I don't think we have anyone in any country, in any discipline, in any industry, in any government function that has any more idea than anyone else what's emerging. And we're talking about a, a, an emergence that's occurring in a relatively short period of time, certainly within my lifetime, we're going to begin to see some radical changes. You could call this a paradigm shift if you like, but I, I think it, from a philosophical point of view, it's more, more profound than that because this is a change in our, in, in our existence. This is a change in our way of being. This is the emergence of a new human being, something that's beyond mere homo sapien. And, and I don't know what that's gonna look like, but I think unless that emerges, it's unlikely that we as a species are going to adapt well to whatever happens. And I don't mean just physically, well, people who watch this program know that I like to talk with thinkers. I like to talk with people who examine the world in which they live. Um, but today I'm having some trouble with this particular idea, this notion, because, and you can help me through this. Um, if what you say is true, then that opens the door for a level playing field for anyone who can grab the forefront. It's, it's an interesting idea that there's a new human being emerging and we don't know what's going to happen. But at the same time, by saying that, that gives legitimacy to anyone who steps forward. Don't you have to have some clear leaders, thinkers like yourself out front on the wagon train, leading the way through the unknown territory with some agreed upon rules. Otherwise, 
I know my answer, my question is rooted in historical fact. I understand that. Well, I, I don't deny that there certainly is, is going to be a, a sort of a, a sequence of situational leaders. And I think people, you're right, that anyone could rise and, and, and step to the front of the train. And much the way if you looked at a flock of geese, uh, the same bird is not at the point all the time. You know, they, they, they fall back and they adjust and, and they adapt to the, whatever the particular uh, situation may be. Uh, that's one of the metaphors I use in, in my book about living in a real-time world. Uh, but the point here is, uh, I, I don't know, and I don't know that anyone knows. So all that any of us, I think, can do is take umbrance with the fact that we are co-creating this future together. And, and that, that, you know, there, it doesn't mean we can't make commitments and we can't draw on our experience and we can't draw on our our ideals and our images and our models and so forth. But I think we need to be very light fingered and very, very uh, patient with the fact that, that uh, you know, who could have predicted this pandemic? Who could have predicted, I wrote the book before the pandemic. And the subtitle of that was six capabilities to prepare us for an unimaginable future. That's the subtitle of living in a real time world. And here we are inside living in an unimaginable future. And people are sort of nostalgically, you know, imagining that we're gonna go back to normal. And certainly there's a lot of movement in that direction currently. By the same token, a lot of people, a lot of the old assumptions are breaking down. The workforce is not rushing back to take those menial jobs. You know, people, the millennials, for example, are not willing to, to uh, engage their lives in rote labor and, and uh, you know, go through the motions of work in order to, to make a cha paycha paycheck. And, and again, that's all part of this sort of reconfiguration of reality that we're in the middle of, I think. Uh, so I, I, I wish I had some answers, but I don't. I do have a, a belief that uh, it's all emerging in a, in a positive way, but I can't even say that. I mean, the whole idea of modernity and uh, progress and the future is inherently gonna be better than the past, you know, it's, that ain't necessarily so. You know, and it could very well be that uh, you and I have lived in the golden age of human beings, you know, and that uh, we're in for a fairly dark future. But my concern is not whether it's going to be bright or dark or whether to be optimistic or pessimistic. I think it's simply to wake up and say, we are in the middle of the ocean right now. You know, we're in the middle of the, of the transition and we are uh, without any certainty about much of anything except who we are, where we are, maybe where we came from and whatever future we can imagine creating together. It would be easy to inter end the interview with that point because it's, it's well made. But let me see, discuss another consequence of this. In those times when we did not know as a civilization about the future, religion played an enormously important role. Based on not knowing, that gives a lot of fodder to belief systems cropping up again. Because if you don't know, you make good stuff up. So uh, do you see that as a possibility? I already see it in our society, but do you see that as? Sure, I, I, think, I, think, what, I think we are make it, gonna make it up. I mean, uh, there was a definition of transformation I read once in a book called uh, The Truth About the Truth. And it was talking about different philosophical pathways and traditions and so forth. But it, but it said one of the pathways is called transformation. And what does that mean? Well, transformation basically means making it up and pretending it's real. It's, a, it's imagining the future that, that you want and then living as if that's true, as mm -hmm. if that's true. And if your actions are consistent with that vision, if your actions are consistent with that possibility, then eventually either, either will be realized and manifest or you'll abandon and have to make up something else. 
Well, it is a delight to talk to you, Jim. I mean, it's uh, it's always takes me into a new place. It, it makes life worth living right now. And I look forward to future conversations with you. Thank you, Jim. Well, Phyllis, thank you so much. This next interview is with someone who uh, I absolutely loved and adored, who's no longer with us. Kristen died last year in June. She was living in her home country, Scotland. She's one of my favorite people. I met her while I was on the faculty at Emerson College in Boston. Kristen went on to Columbia University and also is responsible for the professional voices of so many of the great actors and actresses that you know today. So I share this with you and uh, I'm so grateful to having had the privilege of knowing Kristen Linklater. I've known Kristen for years, but I had no idea all the important actors she has helped to express themselves. From Patrick Stewart, of course, my favorite, Alfre Woodard, Donald Sutherland, just to name a few. We would be here all night. And you are known primarily for this extraordinary view you have about the use of the voice, as opposed to voice technique, working with the natural voice. So I want to start by asking you the first question. Don't you have a wonderful voice just because you're from Scotland? <laughs> you've, you've rumbled me, yeah. <laughs> it's not my training, it's my, it's my, yeah, it's my genetic background. Uh, <clears throat> Probably, I think uh, rain and wind are very good for, uh, for opening up the voice, opening up the throat, uh, being in touch with nature and, and, and so on. Uh, I did, and it's true, I do have a family voice. The family is, uh, is vocally pretty, um, pretty strong, I have to say. But, and I mostly work with people whose voices are not big and strong and rich and full of range. I mostly work with people whose voices have been scared into hiding. Little voices. Hiding behind their noses. <laughs> hiding in their jaws. It's very hands-on work because each individual has, uh, has their own physical habits that I need to interfere with if we're going to change those habits. And those physical habits are uh, usually to do with somehow with protecting, with defending, with holding on. And the first place that people hold on is in their breathing area. So that these muscles get tight. And when these muscles get tight, then breathing is compromised from within. And I very often have to come round and put my hands on the belly and say, oh, couldn't you just let those muscles go and let the breath come down to this place? How does that feel? And people either burst into tears at that point, because when you start to breathe and you haven't been breathing for 10 or 20 years, it's amazing the stuff that may be locked behind those tense muscles. And, uh, uh, but, and sometimes they laugh, and sometimes they just say, that feels so much better. Can you have an effect on someone who's had a bad habit for a long time? Yes, yes. I mean, the earlier you catch it, the better, obviously, because it's all to do with consciousness. Uh, I mean, becoming conscious of what it is that you do and, and how locked in you are to those habits. But, oh, anybody, everybody. I've worked with 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, uh, uh, and um, I do the same thing with, with, with everybody. And, and most people enjoy the experience of relaxation so and, and it's very specific relaxation it's relaxation of the these central belly muscle areas relaxation of the jaw relaxation of the throat in order to provide a wider channel and it's it's such a pleasurable thing that uh, people latch onto it quite fast and, and age is not such a problem how would you contrast what your technique is to the standard voice techniques for theater development? Well, I, I think that my ear is here. I have ears down here. So I hear with my body. Uh, and that my ear is not judging the result. My ear, my body is tuning in to somebody else's body and voice. 
And I only do this, don't worry, I only do this when I'm being paid to, <laughs> to, to listen in this way. I'm not judgmental otherwise of, how, of people's voices. But I tune in, I tune in, it's mo more, more than listening in, in any kind of critical way. And I think probably the, the more conventional ways of training say there is a specific result which we want you to get to, there's a way you should be speaking, there's a placement of your voice which you should be achieving, and we can uh, call that right or wrong. So it's more a judgment of results, and I'm much more interested in the causes, causally, what is allowing the voice to reveal the person. That's what the voice is for, is so that we can tune in to the person behind the voice. Women hold themselves back in expression more than men? Oh. Um, what do you think for this? <laughs> you are probably a very free woman in your expression, but there is a there. Uh, there's still a huge culture of uh, of of silencing oneself as a woman in order to defer to the man's voice, in order not to scare the man. Uh, there is sometimes the sense that if I let my voice be deep and strong, that man's manliness is going to shrivel somehow. Uh, that, that it is much pleasanter to speak in a breathy, unconfronting tone of voice that says, you could look after me because I really don't know how to do that. Or one that, that still is sort of a little girl up behind the nose. And uh, that won't threaten anybody, and it won't threaten the patriarchy in any way. Sorry to get political there. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. So yes, I do think that there is still a lot that's happening with women's voices that, that could be opened up so that the intrinsic, the natural, easy power of women could be expressed more readily, more fully, and more in, the, in, in our civilization. What is your desired working format? How do you like to work with people? In groups? Individually? Yes, I like groups. I'm a bit of a ham. And uh, uh, I, I, like, I love my students. I love my graduate students. They're intelligent. They're talented. They're greedy. They really want to learn. And at this stage, I've been teaching for 50 years, over 50 years. 53. And around the world, not and just... Yes, quite a lot around the world. But I love coming back to Columbia University, the theatre program, School of the Arts, where I have these eager graduate students who want to go into the theatre, they want to go into movies, they want to go into television, and they have something enormously potent in them that, that is connected with a talent that has an artistic content and they want to study the classics because they know if they get their roots in the classics then they can open the door to tomorrow's theatre uh, with ease. When you travel back to Scotland, what do you do? What does Kristen Linklater do in Scotland? I sit in my lovely little house with windows over there, I look down to the lochs in the middle of the island. Over there, I look over to the hills in the distance. Over there, I look out to the cliffs and the sea, which is the Atlantic. And if I could see far enough, I'd see Newfoundland. Uh, in front of me, there are fields and cows and sheep. And there are seagulls. And I sit and watch the weather. It's a meteorological soap opera. <laughs> and I thoroughly enjoy that. You have, in addition to your wonderful self, a wonderful son. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about him? That was the best thing I ever did, yes, was to have my, my son. Um, proud single mother, choosing. I chose to, 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 I needed to have this child when I was 40. And I thought, if I wait until I'm a, until I'm a, 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 a well-balanced human being, until I go ahead and become a mother, it'll be far too late. So I better go ahead and do it. So I did. He is, he's now a, a very good actor. He's in his early 30s, and he's been doing a sitcom. Some people may have 
tuned into it, uh, which is now finished, called The New Adventures of Old Christine. He's the slacker brother. And now he, and then he's a fantastic Shakespeare actor. He's played Hamlet twice, he's played Romeo twice. He was in Central Park this summer playing Bassanio to Al Pacino's um, Shylock, mm -hmm. shared the dressing with Al Pacino. His name. Oh, his, my son's name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hamish Linklater. Well, we'll use those wonderful words, <laughs> Hamish Linklater, as a deep thank you to you, Kristen. Thank well, you thank so you. much for this. Such and fun. Uh, I wish you the best. Luck. We Sounds wish great. you the best. Thank you.